Visiting Director of the Waterloo Institute for Health Informatics Research. So thank you for joining us today in our final uh, Smarter Health Seminar on the series of Health Informatics Tools for the Future. That's, this is not to say that we aren't continuing our seminars. We will. But we're going to take a break over the summer and re resume in September. So we'll have information t out to everybody shortly about uh, the new series and, and uh, when we will resume in September. I actually know the date. It's September the 28th. For those of you that have your calendars with you already, you can put a place marker in it right now. We welcome those of you that are joining us via our webcast of this seminar. Thank you for coming in via that way, too. And of course, this, this will be, is being recorded so that we'll have it up on our website very shortly next week. A special welcome to our speaker, Sam Marifiotti. Sam is vice chair of the Ontario Hospital eHealth Council, and he has this incredible title at Sunnybrook and Women's College Health Sciences Centre in Toronto. He's Vice President of Corporate Strategy and Development and CIO as well. So I don't know how you have time to uh, do all the things you're doing, let alone come here to give this seminar. So we're very grateful that you came today. I've heard Sam speak before, so I know you'll enjoy his presentation uh, today on eHealth. This is a topic that is very much in the news, as you're aware. Uh, there are eHealth conferences all across the globe. Uh, eHealth associations and organizations are being formed constantly. So, it, but with all of this, I'm really not sure what the definition of e-health is, so I'm looking forward to Sam's presentation, so I, perhaps he can tell me what e-health is, and, and in particular, what it is in, in the con context of Ontario. A special thank you to our seminar series sponsors, McKesson, VON Canada, uh, Healthcare Information Management and Communications Canada, and Smart Systems for Health Agency. So, uh, without any further ado, I'll let Dominic Covey, the uh, founding director of the Institute, introduce our speaker. Dominic? Well, surely it's not much of a real introduction. <laughs> I promise to be nice to Sam today, but you know, I usually don't let that restrict me. I don't know how long we've known each other, probably 10 or 15 years, I don't know, back and forth. Uh, I knew Sam when he was involved in IT and very early I guess you're very early in your IT part of your career. And Sam's background, I learned today, is uh, social work. So he's an ideal combination of the human component. We have some people I know that, uh, as well as the technology component. Um, I've had the privilege of working with Sam over the last uh, about four or five months uh, on the Hosp Hospital Z Health Council. And uh, I can tell you that uh, Sam has been leading quite an agenda there in uh, ensuring that uh, the money in Ontario is well spent with regard to the creation of programs that uh, really serve the health system. So uh, it's been very interesting working with you and uh, it's very privileged to have that opportunity. The uh, work that's been done at Sunnybrook over the years is remarkable. Uh, those of you who don't know, they were one of the early groups, if not the first group, to really get involved with picture archiving and communication systems, uh, one of the first uh, real telehealth applications. Uh, I've had many uh, innovations in the area of uh, hospital information systems uh, over the years. Uh, I knew their clinical and uh, epi general epidemiology group there was a landmark group of people. And I was asking Sam about that today, and I understand that it continues. So what we have in Sam is a person who's a mixture of an administrator, a background in the social sciences, and an involvement in a very, very large campus. Uh, with regard to information technology. So it's a, it's a unique opportunity, and uh, we're looking very much forward to that. Sam, welcome. Uh, thank you, Shirley, and thank you, Dominic, and uh, thank you for attending. And for those of you I gave, who I met earlier in the parking lot and gave $20 to attend, thank you as well. Um, I wanted to start off by uh, telling you why, I, why I'm really here today. Uh, and that's because I'm a sinner. And I had uh, the good fortune of speaking at uh, a conference about a year and a bit ago, the Bell University Lab Conference. And uh, I had great intentions at the, at the time of acknowledging some of the work Dominic has done in the past. In fact, did do that. But uh, I acknowledged the work that Dominic was doing recently with respect to University of Western Ontario. Uh, so I'm here today to atone for my sins. Uh, to set uh, the record straight and proud to be here at the Waterloo Institute uh, for Informatics Research. 
Uh, my talk today is uh, going to cover three areas. I want to talk to you about what e-health needs to be and the message it needs to deliver. To do that, I need to set the context for you, certainly from my perspective, of some of the key issues challenging the healthcare system and uh, provide a little bit of an update. And, and Dominic can surely have seen some of these issues, but in any case, it's always good to do a report card update because last time they saw some of these issues, it was 2004, and it's almost like a current scan. Uh, talk a bit about technology, but in this case, talk about what the real issues are going to be about and usually are when you're dealing with transformation, and that's change and culture and people. And technology certainly can enable those issues as a platform in a very significant way, but ultimately we really need to understand our message, be able to articulate it, be able to really define e-health. Uh, quite frankly, e-health has to become a mainstream concept, uh, be written about in the shadow lanes, in the times, and those types of of media, and until and unless we cross that uh, uh, mainstream concept from what it is at the moment, um, uh, def a defined entity amongst uh, vested interest groups and stakeholders, uh, I quite frankly don't think we're going to see it have a terribly significant impact uh, because all it really is is a redefinition of what we used to call this, and we used to call it IT, MIS in the 70s, and now it's eHealth. So I'm going to cover those three areas um, and hopefully uh, engage you in some of that discussion. So let's talk about the current system, and you've all read about it, heard about it, and continue to hear about it, um, notwithstanding the good news yesterday that the hospitals received uh, uh, from the provincial government in terms of funding and the health system um, at large will benefit from that. And secondly, the fact that it was multi-year gives us for the first time ever a solid footing in terms of understanding what uh, our planning principles are, certainly from the economic construct. But we're facing, quite frankly, other significant issues that money in and of itself cannot solve. Uh, the real issue in terms of the human resource agenda, particularly as it relates to physician shortages and other uh, professional uh, allied services is uh, certainly the most significant and severe that I've ever seen it. Um, the fact that the uh, McGuinty government a couple weeks ago uh, dealt with mandatory retirement or the cap therein is quite frankly going to be a benefit to industries such as healthcare because the sh uh, shortages in real areas that were commonplace in the past are quite significant. For example, in Metro Toronto, uh, in the area of vascular surgery, we are now uh, stuck with trying to solve a model for a city as large as Toronto in vascular surgery where we have six vascular surgeons available to cover the entire city. So we're forced to look at new collaborative enterprises, how to deal with on-call support to trauma centers in the case of Sunnyburg Women's and St. Mike's and provide coverage to other surgical areas that require vascular. And I can go on to list others, but that's one example that's real, that's here today, uh, here with the reality that within those six, two of them have said they want to retire and do not want to provide those services, and very little coming up the ranks through the universities, even with the new Northern Medical School and the new placement. Uh, we are a decade out from seeing any relief on this issue. Uh, furthermore, the flip side of that has meant more workload, more pressures, more expectations, and obviously you're going to get a uh, quality of life issue uh, re represented in burnout, fatigue, and what have you. So we have that issue. It's quite significant. In fact, probably the most significant issue that eHealth will need to think about. We have on the expectation side, the societal expectation, issues of access and quality gaps depending on where you may happen to live in the province and, and what type of access to service and care is available to you. Uh, so acknowledged not only in Ontario but across the country, the concept of discontinuous and fragmented care and what that means relative to getting effective and integrated care, particularly in the procedures that you've heard about, whether it's hips and knees, cancer, cataracts, heart surgery, and medical imaging access. Real issue, that's led to waiting lists. And when you end up with this fra uh, discontinuous and fragmented care, where uh, obviously the whole issue of risk with fewer and fewer human resources that are uh, seeing symptoms of fatigue, 
uh, and stress uh, has really taken the patient safety issue to the forefront in many ways. Knowledge and technology has been very significant in terms of the power of uh, enabling, the power of productivity. Uh, but on the other hand, it's brought out some other pressures related to expectations of the consumers in the system, uh, both consumers who work within the system as providers, but also citizens of Ontario who expect certain services and certain things to be in place, quite frankly, in many respects, take for granted. The growth of information availability, not only on the patient side, but more particularly in terms of the access to information and knowledge to the provider, uh, has quite frankly meant that there's no way that they can keep up with the new knowledge that is created and, and needs to be made available to them. So we think there's a role for e-health and, and technology to enable that. And I did touch upon the fiscal con constraints. Uh, there's never going to be enough money. Therefore, the issue becomes fundamental transformation, expectation management, which needs to become a public policy issue and debate. Uh, and there's good articles and the many on that issue, notwithstanding Quebec. Uh, and obviously, we all know, uh, whether it's in the university structures and the academic system or in the healthcare system, uh, our infrastructure in this province uh, does need significant new uh, infusion. So, so those issues represent a sustainable question and therefore uh, a lens and a backdrop that we need to understand. Uh, very quickly then, and this used to say as of 204, so I just did an update because not much has changed. Uh, so all I did was change the 4 to the 5 and, and this is the reality check on the technology backdrop related to the healthcare system. Uh, we do have underinvestment in the information, communication, and technology field as an industry. And we don't know what the right percentage of operating expenditures ought to be. We do know that any external uh, research study that is brought forward, whether it's the U.S., quite frankly, or Canada and other uh, GDP reported countries, always show healthcare ICT investments as the lowest bar, the lowest expenditure as a percentage of OPEX. So we need to understand this issue but solve it uh, because we're also challenged uh, to deal with the value that the promise of new investments might bring. So let's park that for the moment. We work in a system that still is primarily paper-based. Uh, we've made good progress. The investments we've had have been wisely uh, distributed and implemented. Uh, as is the case in my organization. Uh, we spend roughly, by the way, 2% of our operating budget on IT. That's what we can afford, and we, although believe uh, more would stretch our opportunity, quite frankly, 2% is not something that we terribly complain about. But it has given us opportunity to deal with digital acquisition, digital distribution, and automation of a lot of our workflow and data capture processes. But by and large, as a system, Every family doctor in this province, I shouldn't say every, most of them are still running paper-based office modules and most of the healthcare expenditure and management comes from that modality. Hospitals have made good progress in that regard and we will be publishing a study, actually the OHA will, Dominic has, has been uh, chairing that group for us, that gives us a point of presence on this issue. So we need to think about that. Furthermore, there are those, the haves and have-nots as usual, so you will have organizations like academic centers who might have an opportunity to spend anywhere between 2 and 4 percent, who have a technology capability, but then you may have other sectors, whether it's primary care, whether it's community sector, whether it's um, uh, long-term care, that represent varying technology capabilities and as such that imbalance does not allow you to architect workflow or information exchange. Uh, and data collection and storage and management is, is obviously fragmented when you cannot architect and provide that capability. And finally, and disappointingly so in this regard, given my three years at the OHG on the eHealth file, we still do not see uh, a powerful transformation agenda that is clear, that is able to very quickly zone in on some of these key issues and begin to see some true transformation uh, occur and to see that happen, quite frankly, in local communities uh, with regional partnerships moving up to provincial structures. So we believe firmly in investment in this particular arena within the context of a reality that 95% of healthcare transactions 
are usually between the practitioner and the patient, obviously the most trusted relationship, and usually within a local home community. You have to build the solution then around that context, so I'll talk about that as well. When you look at that uh, challenge that 205 represents, uh, access, safety, and sustainability, which are three significant thematic areas uh, that the government overall transformation agenda in healthcare is uh, purported to uh, want to be moving to resolve, uh, is in effect compromised. Um, has been, but continues now with the human resource issue to see more severe uh, occurrences of some of these challenges that have probably been inherent and, and latent within the system for, for decades. Um, obviously, if you see to the right, the image of prescriptions being handwritten must, by their very nature, lead to error. No ifs, ands, or buts about that. Many studies in the last year, a number of years uh, published to, to tie true research and evidence to that reality. Uh, if information is not instantly and readily available, both having to be the case, instantly from a technology perspective, readily in terms of good, solid, real-time information, then the tendency of clinicians, obviously, is to reorder tests that have already been uh, requested because they can't find the results. So that's the easy thing to do. Uh, and given that they're not readily available, the concept of sharing and information management is, is uh, pretty evident. Care is compromised, uh, obviously, if you do not have the complete information record and uh, information that is required from one patient episode to the next, then obviously, uh, as any good decision would be, uh, one would ought to be suspicious of, of what that implies. Uh, and uh, quite frankly, there's a number of administrative uh, lapses that uh, are, are now demanded uh, and expected just because in other industries these are quite frankly commonplace yesterday's news and in healthcare we are still talking about them and uh, as I mentioned the whole concept of medical lit literature and knowledge and translation of new knowledge uh, uh, indicates that uh, there needs to be a role for technology to to help mitigate that so when you sum all of these issues together Culture, change, and transformation really become the powerful paradigms that we need to look at. So, when you look at this from the point of view of three simple stakeholders within the uh, system and, and look at that perspective uh, on a go-forward basis, you need to obviously first and foremost focus, certainly in our view, on the patient. And, and they want and expect, and quite frankly, I'm sure, as I do, often talk to people, uh, socially or otherwise, who often say, well, don't you do that already? Don't you already have those integrated systems? It's as expected, and people believe that that's what exists. What they want is access to timely, accurate information, not only for themselves, but more particularly to be satisfied and, and uh, ensured that their providers do indeed have that to make informed decisions. The providers, I think more and more what they're wanting, uh, given the context that I laid, is a better quality of work life, uh, and that doesn't mean better hours. It means to be able to handle the uh, pressures of workload, the pressures of new knowledge, uh, the pressures of government expectations, of administrative expectations. They need to see much more support uh, in terms of the transference of information to them in a packaged uh, 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 utility fashion so that their work is enabled and the communication tools give them the confidence that not only are they working in a safe environment, but they're actually practicing care in a safe environment. And that is, quite frankly, key to healthcare providers. They are there to serve patients. That is their single most important uh, commitment and oath, and they need to feel that we are protecting them and that value. And finally, government, more than ever, this government has a results-based agenda, wants accountability for the use of funds both on an efficiency and effectiveness basis, and we need to kind of bear that stakeholder uh, issue in mind. So when you look at the Ontario healthcare system strategic directions, uh, and this comes from some, some of the material that uh, has been shared with us, you see on the left um, some of the current state issues in terms of the system that I'm describing. Uh, we deal with encounters right now. One provider, one encounter, one episode of care. Uh, a lot of the system is siloed and fragmented. 
in terms of how care and rec even record keeping is accrued. Uh, we are a system that can handle crises very well, uh, but can we manage population health? Can we manage the public health of communities? So we are reactive and short-term in nature. It's the very nature of hospitals, quite frankly. Uh, the entire century has developed a health system that is based on a provider model and supporting the providers in the provision of care with little to no involvement of the patient and or consumer on a health information concept. And uh, care is usually conceived of as being institutionally based, and it is by and large, uh, and therefore centered uh, in smaller communities, particularly in that concept. And the accountability is usually vested uh, at the institutional level and expected there, where the, and then within the institution's individual assignment. On the right, you will see some of the directions that this government particularly is promoting with some of the new concepts, uh, which uh, should be lauded, quite frankly, because they're moving in the right direction. Uh, they're moving to a much more comprehensive, uh, patient-centered uh, uh, direction, one which is trying, quite frankly, uh, to make sure that hospitals do not continue to burgeon and grow, and in fact are contained to provide specialized tertiary, quaternary, high-tech surgical procedures, and to focus more on prevention and wellness so that the success and measure of success quite frankly, should be and ought to be keeping people out of hospitals, for example. Uh, we are seeing a shift to integrated uh, continuum, sorry about that, uh, integrated continuum of health services. So primary care interfaces, uh, which are for usually ambulatory services, into hospital care, discharge out to home care, uh, community supports, that needs to see a much more significant information and administrative flow, so we are encouraged by that opportunity. System uh, reaction needs to be evidence-based. A lot of healthcare is still very much trial and error. Order the test, see what the result is. Order another test, see what the result is. A lot of movement with respect to the effective use of clinical guidelines which are based on well-established evidence in terms of efficacy and use of drugs particularly. 15% per annum is the growth of drugs at the moment. Single most important issue that scares governments right now in healthcare. Interdisciplinary approaches, so moving away from the traditional physician-patient model to teams of clinicians that are involved in the care of the patient. Community-centered. Uh, approaches, so the population health concept, geographically defined communities that are looked after by these teams, by these new amalgams. And finally, a system of accountability that really starts with the individual and moves up through the community so that we then ultimately as citizens can see a system-wide accountability. So encouraging strategic directions. And ultimately, they really kind of imply what must be considered as foundational on a cultural basis that integrated approaches that really focus on the three stakeholders that I showed, represent it in the strategic directions, see a convergence of those three stakeholders and their needs, which I believe can be met, uh, and understanding the interdependencies and the affect of one to the other. So I think that's fundamentally important to consider. So what? you say. And what does that have to do with e-health? Uh, well, e-health uh, has been recognized, quite frankly, in every significant study, both nationally and, and provincially across the country, and many studies in Europe and south of the border, as being, quite frankly, the key, the key enabler, not a key enabler, but the key enabler for moving the healthcare system to some of the strategic directions that are implied. Uh, so it must play a key role in that, uh, whether it's patient safety, whether it's the management of waiting lists. You've read about that and seen a lot about that in the media recently. And you've heard that we and read we do not have good information, nor access to waiting lists, nor access to where the waiting lists might be uh, more accessible to patients who are prepared to move out of the area. So key role to be played. And secondly, um, it's a strategic opportunity for people in our industry uh, to make a difference, to be a significant other, 
uh, to allow a social worker who was wet behind the ears to make a difference by using social topology and thinking and technology to make a difference in this space. So let's talk about e-health a bit. This is the second part of, of what I want to represent. Definition. This is a definition that we put together, cobbled together at the OHA right from the get-go. And we said that if we need to communicate some of the principles that were important to us, we really need to represent them in the definition. And the principles that were important to us, being the hospital sector, uh, were that this was not about further investments in hospitals, within the walls of hospitals, because by and large we were cobbling together individual health systems that provided effective and efficient support to care if you happen to have an episode within a hospital. So we first and foremost wanted to make it clear that it ought to be a consumer-centered model of health care. And our interpretation of the word consumer here was broad-based. Consumer as a provider, as a provider in the system, they are consumer of e-health. And certainly a patient as consumer. And thirdly, a citizen who will not be a patient but requires health information and wants to be involved and engaged. So broad scope and view of consumer in this definition, but it had to be centered around that key premise. Secondly, stakeholders needed to collaborate, so it wasn't good enough to just focus on the domain of the consumer. We needed to very quickly lay out a value that the collaboration of all the stakeholders in the system was crucial for an effective integration of information, communication, whether it's within teams, but more broadly. And thirdly, the concept of powerful, powerful. In 2001, uh, very much uh, being served and experiencing the growth of powerful and phenomenal, quite frankly, new technologies that have never been available before to the information technology industry. And the convergence of information and communication technologies suggested a move away from the transactional nature of our information supports to a much more broadly accessible and available and, most importantly, simple set of tools that allowed for peer-to-peer -peer relationships, new roles and responsibilities defined, as we've seen in many other industries where the Internet and the tools of the Internet have enabled that in quite significant, uh, significantly short amount of times. So the role for technologies, and all of that to continue to do fundamentally what are the five mega things that are expected by the three stakeholder groups that the healthcare system really represents. The, uh, the opportunity of managing health, so the health population, and that is directed to provision of health education, health information, and knowledge to that proportion of our society. And if health, uh, the health of an individual became such that they required the services of the health care side because they were becoming a patient, you need to schedule an appointment, you need to schedule a test, you needed to be able to follow up uh, the care. So that is what we call arranging for care. Uh, that component happens regularly. Uh, then while that episode of care is being administered, the actual delivery of care, whether it's a heart surgery, or the ordering of a lab test, we needed to address that principle and be accountable for that care by using real evidence, by using real knowledge, uh, real clinical guidelines and outcomes to tie that to the nature of the episode. And at the government level and at the administrative level, when you sum total that, say, now, by the way, uh, is the effective use of all these resources and the provision of care held up to the highest standard of accountability, and can we say as leaders that we're truly managing the healthcare system? So we cobbled this def definition together with those three principles in mind. So the change culture that we need to think about using the backdrop of e-health as defined, I would suggest to you, um, in our view at Sunnybrook Women's particularly, and it's a set of value statements, and it's a bit of everything. Uh, the concept of increasing awareness uh, to drive the improvements focus primarily now on the quality agenda, the safety agenda, and the cost of health care services to us has to be always at the forefront of the discussion. Laying the foundation for, and in this case it says international, and we obviously need to start locally, but ultimately we believe at Sunnybrook and Women's 
that the concept that is beginning to take hold within the international community that we've been following is something we believe in, and that's the continuity of care record as opposed to an electronic health record on its own. And this is one whereby the consumer begins to have a rightful role in access management and participation in the record. And I'll talk about that in the latter part of my uh, presentation, but also in the permissions and exchange of that information so that medical information can follow the episodes of care. So park that notion, we call that the CCR, uh, continuity of care record, but the introduction of the consumer. The concept that common standards and systems have to be the platform of architectural statement, no ifs, ands, or buts, that's what we have to all be incented to do. But to do that, we need to know what they are. And that's where the provincial leadership model is crucial to what we need to have, that clear articulation I referred to. And as we evolve this change and this culture, the workflow, the role responsibility redefinition, the change management that is required, in our view, cannot occur in the truly transformational fashion unless the activity and involvement of the users, including the consumers, not only the providers, are engaged during the design phases, during the conceptual phases. So we believe in that premise as well. So we need to see a shift away from a provider-centric design only. And certainly clinical decisions have to be supported by the most current and most powerful tools that allow for protocols, procedures, diagnosis to be immediately and instantly supported by the best prescription, the best path, and the best information to allow the informed decision to occur. And consumer engagement strategies so that, in fact, the innovation and transformation sees real pressure on the paradigm shift from the provider-centric model to one which legitimately involves the consumer, sees the active engagement of the consumer in this process. So I'm going to move quickly now to the technology piece of the presentation and, and do it quickly to respect those who are not technology uh, interested, but I think it's important to really get this issue on the table and off the table in terms of the capability and, as I suggest here, no limits opportunity. Uh, if we look back, we look at what's, what's changed with respect to this file. Uh, patients do expect high-tech healthcare, whether it's ICT, uh, PACS, uh, type of telehome care environments, that's what's expected because we have technology-savvy customers in every demographic group now in our society. The digital divide has been bridged by broadband, which is cheap. It's available to the, by the penny now, and will more and more be so, whether it's wired or wireless. Why? Because the consumer side of this particular area is making that happen worldwide, quite frankly. Wireless connectivity is now well established as commonplace rather than a niche functionality. In our organization, for example, at Sunnybrook and Women's, we provide secure wireless connectivity throughout the entire three campus organization. And that is once again to extend the ability of clinicians and workers to have access to information in whatever format is required. And more and more we see a comfort level of that wireless connectivity occurring on the form factor, whether it's PDA, laptop, mobile device, but I use PDA here, to be something that is becoming more and more ubiquitous and commonplace, so that you don't have to do your work at a fixed time and location. And the extension of that wireless connectivity does have implications not only for the providers who can now work at home through VPN connections seamlessly and look at their digital images at home if they're on a consult across communities, uh, but more particularly in terms of patients and consumers who also have that same uh, concept and capability. Once again, largely because they have wireless networks at home, more and more becoming commonplace. Attention to accountability, as I mentioned, has become front and center. 
and patient safety, particularly in the accountability uh, to that theme is, is uppermost in the minds of all, particularly organizations. At Sunnybrook of Women's, we have as one of our strategic themes overarching all of our care is the statement as follows, to be the safest hospital in Canada. We need to be able to declare that. We need to be able to say that we are prepared to measure and account for that. Business intelligence, BI and business process management are back in the spotlight more than ever. We need to look at all of this data that we have, lots of it, and really account for whether the evidence suggests that the investments in the procedures and the care are producing a more healthy population, one that's expected. So that's some of the, upper, the backdrop on looking back. If you look around and look at what hasn't changed, um, healthcare processes are by and large are still a big black box. Um, Patients don't have access to participate in coordination of care. Uh, on this particular issue, we have other industries that are referred to, and you probably have experience with many of them in your own lives, where this type of consumer expectation, albeit not on a grand scale, and doesn't need to be grand, but it is commonplace, and I list a couple examples here. So we need to think of that and move it forward. Information management is still very important but we're still not sure what the key performance metrics are. We need to identify those. Uh, we definitely need to understand the correlation between financial and clinical information. And I can guarantee you that this particular issue with the 15% of pharmaceutical costs year over year increasing in generic versus labeled drugs will force this issue to be resolved using that as a proxy. And uh, we have to, in that paradigm, filter out the white noise. There really are only usually, in any business model, a few indicators that matter. So we need to know what the denominator and numerator ought to be for each of the few indicators and filter out the rest. And the support to the frontline staff is usually represented in big projects that take time that are seen to be uh, issues that, um, in some cases, compromise the organization. When I first went to, uh, came to Sunnybrook at the time in 1989, uh, the, there was a circulation at the time, time there was no networks, of a picture of the hospital with a terminal on top of the hospital and the foundations of the hospital cracking and a big dollar sign in the terminal because the perception was that these big IT projects were not showing results, not helping frontline staff, could be while the hospital was crumbling in terms of an infrastructure. We need to change that mentality and mindset. So if we look forward a bit and look at what's needed and look at some of these stakeholders uh, in terms of patients, the concept of information independence uh, and being able to provide information that is personal to them and therefore bi-directional, customizable and portable. Um, the ability to push timely new information to them uh, especially in chronic disease situations, and I'm going to give you an example that we are working on and, uh, and believe very strongly in, and to provide information on demand in terms of mobile access, but also information that is not data only, but also rich in media. So we need to look forward to that. The providers very much are in the same domain. Uh, their information needs to more and more be context-specific, don't just send me the lab result. I need the lab result, the history. I need the lab, uh, the uh, DI. Uh, I need any other social information. And by the way, I need to be able to quickly look at any knowledge uh, resource that is instantly available and hopefully preferably brought to me immediately when the diagnosis is known so that I have the most complete toolkit uh, in rich multimedia context. And I need to be able to access that wherever I am. If I'm on call in critical care and I'm out of the hospital, that has to be instantly available and provided in that context. Uh, granular, but in, uh, customizable. And it has to be regionally ready. Why? Because more and more we need, we'll be seeing, as I use the case of vascular, regional clinician-specific expertise, regional teams of care, the integration of care. So, technologies that enable uh, really have no limits in our view uh, that can 
ac improve the access to the information for a whole ra uh, host of stakeholders. Technologies exist that are ubiquitous now that provide the mobile access to those same providers. Allow for collaboration and communication exchange to be simple and straightforward. And most importantly, extend the reach of the care delivery by consequence. And some of those are thus, and I'm going to run through these quickly. Patient portals allowing us to create the access, the access of the patient and involvement to do a number of things, and I've listed some and I'm not going to read them, but highlight some, to allow them to self-register and self-request an appointment, to allow them to message, to allow them to provide some context in terms of personal information, to set up a personal part of that for a diary and a family history, and to obviously uh, be served by rich media, whether it's educational support for home care, depending on a disease, or to be served by new knowledge that is available based on uh, episodic uh, instances of care. Provider portals, same empowering opportunity. Lots of uh, phenomenal technology that's available that allows us to move from what we currently have, which is data standardized on transactions, to much more context, CCAL is the, context, uh, is the technology here, HL7 CCAL, for those of you in the technology field. Uh, very, very powerful architectural context for the clinical domain. Readily available, we need to be moving in that direction, once again in the context of provider portals that allow for the grouping of their information. And when you do this, you're able to start seeing the examples of smart interfacing, which allows for the sharing of the clinical information, uh, the filtering of that data, the aggregation, and you'll see the example, the build here, uh, current oncology patients with diagnosis X under Y aggregated to be then uh, uh, based on date, range, birth, compared and contrasted by adding a further a filtering aggregate, and then truly transformational when you're doing big research studies over periods of time. So the whole issue of smart interfacing between those data sets through portal technology and through context data. Mobile access to information, uh, all kinds of opportunities. We're working on just about all of these at the moment. Roaming in real time wireless portals. Our, we're working on a project right now where our critical care physicians are currently developing a PDA application based on our electronic record. Well, they want filtered alerts on key patients that they can customize and feel comfortable that they actually can leave the hospital, but be immediately alerted in a wireless network to any condition that they have expected to notify them about. Real, happening, technology is not the limiter. In fact, it's the enabler. Anywhere in the hospital, and quite frankly, in our world, we have academic and research individuals who are uh, at conferences anywhere in the world. And, and we see that really possible and doable. Collaboration, all kinds of powerful portal technologies that allow the silos to see integration occur, groupware, document management, removing any restrictions in terms of teams working collaboratively and having all of the information ported, shared, manipulated, and to do that anywhere, anytime, and search it through the internet. Uh, we use SharePoint as an example here, and, and Cold Fusion as an example on web application that we're working with at Sunnybrook Women's, and certainly the broad uh, spectrum of opportunity and domain of e-learning. Telehome care, we have a project at Sunnybrook and Women's in diabetes where we, in fact, have eliminated the travel and readmission occurrence of patients who uh, traditionally would come back in and out of hospital when home care supports with a hospital consult using a telehome care device with a home care worker beside the patient is all that's required to take the insulin test to transmit the strip through a telephone line, believe it or not, that's all this is, uh, requires, and to have the clinician at Sunnybrook Women's work with the community care individual and the patient in the next uh, step. So personal access via that patient portal would be the modality here and remote monitoring. Uh, in this case, the example is critical care patients who can be monitored as well through the use of tele-video conferencing over the patient specifically mounted to monitor the, uh, the conditions of the patients and to send alerts through software that is available. So, thinking like the customer, 
when we look at that technology and look at the backdrop of our challenges is the final paradigm I want to share with you. And to us at Sunnybrook Women's this is a crucial new uh, direction that we want to pursue because quite frankly uh, the supports we private, provide internally are well established and significantly mature. So we need to use eHealth under this paradigm to drive a change and deliver a new message. And that has to start with an unequivocal recognition that the consumer-centric model is one where consumers as the key stakeholders are involved in the transformation and in fact create the vision with us in some case. What should it look like? How will it serve you and I both? How can it more effectively improve the management of care? So this implies and respects the fact that patients and consumers are alike are in fact interested in how their care is managed, arranged, delivered, and accounted for, both as taxpayers and ultimately as individuals who consume healthcare. And this ought to lead to a new healthcare experience where e-consumers are then recognized not only as stakeholders, but quite frankly become new resources available to us. Uh, and uh, this happens uh, usually through participation in their own care where, in fact, visits to hospitals and the use of hospital resources in this case are prevented because information is av available to them that prevents. Uh, communication tools are used that prevent. Others can participate in the provision of care in the case of family members to provide those supports. And this certainly ought to provide a higher degree of quality to the provision of those services and certainly lead to more effective and accountable care because it's collaborative between the patient and the provider. And I did right at the beginning indicate in a particular e-health definition that in our view, the enabled uh, e-health world still has to be local and more particularly in that local environment between the clinician and the patient. It is still the one-to-one -one trusted relationship that evidence shows must be supported. So the change that is needed and Sunnybrook and Women is, com is, is committing to is taking a lead role in consumer-focused strategy. So we are committing to the development of the health continuity of care record. And in fact, we've launched this initiative. It's a new model of electronic health records that we believe are necessary, where the consumer can in fact push us to the mainstream and as such, consumer portal directed to the development of continuity of care is being currently developed and I'm going to show you a bit of it in a few moments as I begin to wrap up. Um, and in this portal the concept of consumers creating their own record, parts of it, managing parts of it, accessing the information that is made available to them from their care providers by com using it as a communica communication vehicle and obviously being able to share it from one provider to the next are fundamental opportunities. And the promise that we make then through this commitment to our organization first is that there's a balance that we still need to respect and this is uh, going to be accomplished through partnerships and integration activities within the organization and within our region the local health integration networks, the LIN model, which are uh, happening and will become a model of care that we will all participate in. We're going to see the patient positioned as a key stakeholder and respect that and use that as a powerful ally. And obviously the provider needs to see workflow optimization. They don't need to see new applications uh, that force them to work in a way that is not natural to the way that they've been trained and the way that they can be effective. And to do that, we need to provide tools and, in fact, flows of capturing data, sharing it, that is very natural and integrated to their professional development. And in that context of promise, we then hopefully are responding to new expectations, which show on the improved side many issues there that we believe can and ought to be responded to, and at the same time continue to be accountable with respect to the access issues on wait times, the issue of patient safety by managing fewer and fewer patient safety issues. Why? By virtue of knowing more about them and dealing with less duplication and ultimately reducing cost. So our strategies are going to focus on quality, safety, and access. 
They're certainly going to focus on the concept of a continuous care model that is enabled by a continuity of care record with an active involvement of the consumer as a member of the care team and to continue to support our commitment to academic excellence by supporting our researchers and our teachers. And ultimately, we work in a system and therefore have to be ready to provide further support to the partners and initiatives, both public and private, regional and otherwise, uh, that are going to be more and more expected. And if we are able to succeed, then we ought to be able to look at this challenge, which is currently the system of siloing and discontinuous care, where islands of care are not able to integrate. And quite frankly, the key statement here is there is no incentive link at the moment. There just is not to move it to a system where not only do the parts of the system on the outside of this visual need to be integrated, but the patient in the center has to become part of that integration model. And the intent here is to represent the patient as the incentive link and the consumer. And we believe that paradigm and that metaphor really will be the incentive that pushes this agenda, either politically or through expectations and demand. And if that happens, then there are quality initiatives that can be pursued, and this is the whole concept of the, using web workflow tools to make sure that while the patient is in our care as an inpatient, all of the necessary information is actively being collected as part of each care activity so that when the discharge occurs to an outpatient setting, the discharge summary, as we call it, is ready for the patient to take with them. And by the way, the last comment is here is we're going to email a copy to the personal record we've just created for you and um, electronically accessible for you to continue with. So we call that the patient navigator and coordinator. E-prescribing, the PDA wireless model. We have a project with our physicians in the Department of Medicine where they are testing e-prescription on uh, PDAs electronically transmitted to the outpatient pharmacy on site. Uh, we need to get the low-hanging fruit out of the way. This is low-hanging fruit, so that's why that's there. And continuity of care. The pilot that we are doing is with a chronic disease of osteoporosis, very dominant in women, uh, rheuma, uh, rheum rheumatic arthritic conditions. I happen to be a sufferer of rheumatic arthritic condition. Uh, so you're constantly in and out and need good information, good monitoring, good care. And you need all of it to be served, whether you're at home, whether you happen to be in the hospital, and a clearly defined set of activities and care information that needs to be exchanged. And within that, we are developing a portal for the patients in the osteoporosis program, and it will provide four functional groupings. It will allow health status to be recorded in those categories. It will allow the patient as well to request appointments with their care team and their providers, including prescription renewals and referrals as required. It will provide a communication tool both for appointments and for information exchange and certainly allow the provider to provide directly or the consumer in this case to also have their own personal education library. The flip side, is, so this is, uh, these are screens of, in fact, the system, uh, all developed, homegrown. Uh, and in fact, uh, this will be hopefully a partnership that we will be able to announce uh, in the near future that we will extend with the University of Waterloo or, or jointly move forward with the University of Waterloo. Uh, so this is intended to show that it's easy to do from a technology perspective, but quite frankly, available to certain chronic disease conditions that are niche in nature without having to develop a complete electronic health record that is data heavy and information poor and communication disabled, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't take much and it's powerful, it's easy, and it's ubiquitous. So here's some of the screenshots. It's adding a family member for the family page, a procedures page for the patient where they would have a list of procedures and and uh, this will be completed, obviously, by the provider. And for the provider, we have in the same portal, in the same application, four types of application that would be available and specific to them. Obviously, they would be able to be, go into the health status section of the patient that the patient themselves has completed because the patient is also dealing with the privacy and security of this. This is the patient who owns this record and provides secure and 
legislated, i.e., under the legislation of Ontario, proper access and, and provision of that uh, access to the providers at the right time. So I'll, I won't read through that. And similarly so, these screens just reflect the provider can confirm an appointment back to the patient through the same portal. Both of them have, are working from the same portal, just having different views that are necessary to the, to the flow. And ultimately, once again, the technology features of this represent some of the technology no limits comments that I made previously uh, and touch all of the necessary issues that we feel are important to make this a success. So the result will be that CCR portals, in this case, for osteoporosis, have, as you can see, instant global and regional presence, uh, digitally exchanged amongst providers and patients, and readily and constantly available on a 24 by 7 basis based on what the need happens to be. And as such, in closing, it's important to go back to simple vision statements. And in this case, it's simply a matter of determining the thing that can and shall be done, and then we shall find the way, and we can. Thank you. You on the spot, Sam. Uh, looking forward, Don. A couple questions, well. Um, Often, when people accumulate a certain amount of money, they hire a financial advisor to help them manage it, and that financial advisor is independent, usually, of any sales mechanisms, you might say. In other words, they're not a broker, for example. Uh, what happens, you've made this very patient-centric, but I may not be capable, not because I'm stupid, but I may not be capable of managing my health care properly. How would you factor that into this scenario? we made was patient-centered by having defining what their role should be and therefore we are limiting and and working with the individual patients so in, in the case of osteoporosis for each patient that might qualify for being involved in this uh, type of technology and this goes back to the actively work with the consumer and engage them we're hoping 200 patients will be identified that are in fact capable of working with their care provider, not on their own, but with their care provider to in fact manage this. So we have to find the comfort zone, and if it's not something the patient can in fact manage, then we have the default of the electronic provider model and only the provider portal. So it's not one or the other, it's not a one size fits all, it has to be uh, something that is easily available to both, with the most important principle being that the information is always available to the care team through permissions of the patient and available to the patient where they feel comfortable. With your CCR, obviously certain data about me as, as that data ages becomes less relevant to my current condition, whatever it might be. So uh, have you looked at the possibility of, of what the CCR really looks like in terms of uh, you know, the concepts of minimum data set, that is what do you have to know about me, period? Ex yeah. right? Excellent question, actually. The, the, the concept of, of continuity of care record has with it an entire topology uh, that is premised fundamentally on the minimum data set that is required to be exchanged between providers. Uh, so there is an entire topology and body of knowledge that is, has been developed by the continuity of care community that we are subscribing to and it is premised on the minimum amount of data being necessarily available from one care episode to the next. Uh, so all of the Sunnybrook and Women's specific hospital electronic health record is not required by primary care docs. They want some of the data, it has to be time sensitive and, and context sensitive. So that's a good question and yes, that's exactly how it would be designed and developed. Other questions? Uh, I have several. Uh, Sam used one term along the way I didn't quite get, which was virtualized care paths. What did you mean by that? Virtualized care paths? Yes. So, so the concept of, of, of care is in many cases, although the public sees it as high-tech and highly scientific, quite frankly, is very routine. So uh, we run hips and knees replacement 
services at the Orthopedic and Arthritic Institute of Sunnybrook and Women's. Those procedures, and we do the most in the country, follow a very routine care path. This is what you will see when you come to us. This is what will happen on day two. This is what will happen on hour three of day two. And this is what will happen when you discharge. And this is what your therapy will be. All of that is called a care path. And what we want to do is be able to make those care paths totally electronic so that the alerts can be built into the system, both for reminders to the care team that the care path may be off in terms of variations, but more particularly also available to the patient before they come to the hospital through their portal to know what to expect and be informed. Interesting. It was interesting in, in talking with Sam today that uh, we realized that both of us are extraordinarily interested in workflow, and care paths are yet another example of workflow. In fact, uh, as we've got involved in workflow research, as Don says, it, everything looks like workflow. You know, the, uh, it's a very, very important area. You have another comment, or? So you had the concept of care workflow, in effect. And since most of that can be fairly standardized, as long as somebody doesn't have a heart attack on the operating table or something serious like that, that's how you're planning on packaging, have I got? Yeah, you're right. Very controversial concept, because the concept of care paths have been in the healthcare industry for some time. And Clinicians particularly get sensitive to the metaphor analogy that is often used when you talk about care paths. And now we're talking about not only the care paths, but also making them digitally and virtually available. They begin to think of the concept of you're forcing me to practice factory medicine. And we need to move away from those metaphors to ones where we are providing clinical decision support to you. We're providing readily packaged information uh, and helping you and the work that you're doing. And we really need to deal with that, but that is a significant and controversial issue, but part of the culture of change that's required. You should just point out Bayview to the Shouldice Clinic as an example of exactly how it's done. <laughs> yep, good example. Uh, related to that, there's a question in the back if you want. Just while getting to uh, Bill, the uh, what we've noted is in the literature a growing uh, statement that temporal information in care paths is in fact an enemy uh, of the process and uh, is one of the reasons the cookbook medicine is accused. And what people have suggested is moving away from the how and more to the what and allowing the usual variations but making sure that the actual critical uh, activities are accomplished by some time mm -hmm. as an utter limit but not so much of a formulaic kind of approach to it. So uh, there's been a reaction, and, and even in languages, for definition of care paths to move away from that temporal. So the opportunity there, and that's actually a good point, because this is the paradigm of applications which traditionally would, from an application view, automate all of the functions of the care path to using the powerful new tools that are available to, in fact, just deal with the workflow that is natural to what the care path implies, but ultimately allows you to deal with the accountability of the outcome. Yeah, so I think we have the opportunity to more positively uh, uh, change the attitude of the people who in the past have been suspect, looked on the issue of care path automation suspiciously, to now, uh, in fact, take what you've just said and make it a powerful ally because it will provide workflow enabling, but still follow a path of care. One of the things that, one of the insights we had, and we'll only talk, we're going to meet and talk about this in the next few weeks, but the, uh, is that in fact workflow, the way it's been conceptualized, is often um, thought about as a series of temporal steps. Rather, we're saying is forget that concept of workflow. Workflow is what happens, at, what's happened. It's a historic record. Workflow is the result of, in fact, a series of decisions, often hundreds of decisions, impacting which things are done in, in a, an appropriate order. There are some precedences, mm -hmm. but we can move away from this cookbookish kind of temporal, do A and then do B, then do C, to something like A, B, and C need to be done. Uh, assuming there are no precedences, you can make choices based in real time on which of A, B, and C should be done, and so on, and you move away from that very factory-oriented approach to, uh, to workflows. The counter-argument or the counterbalance to that will have to be, however, uh, Dominic, the recognition that more than ever, more than ever, uh, on the issue of accountability, 
governments particularly are asking for clear evidence that, and that they use clinical guidelines. Cancer Care Ontario particularly is now funding the provision of care to those hospitals explicitly based on providing evidence that, particularly in the case of drug therapy, that the clinical guidelines that have been published and the care paths they're in are in fact what are being used for the procedures. Otherwise, your funding is, is going to be uh, disincented. So the accountability issue is a factor now on how, uh, how much of a scope of flexibility one has in this debate. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to see how much latitude we will have indeed on supporting workflow enablement versus the need to be held accountable to running care paths in a very uh, specific and deliberate way so that we can prove the accountability that's tied to funding. Uh, there's going to be a debate and a discussion that I'm sure will emerge on that, so uh, we'll have to, to look at that issue, but it's not one or the other. It's going to have to be a blend of the both. Bill? Okay, interestingly enough, I'm actually not going to ask about workflow, even though that's what I'm most concerned with myself. I'm actually concerned with the uh, CCR idea. Everyone would like an electric health record, but obviously um, there's no real standard for it as far as I see, like um, global or national standard or anything like that. And uh, they have a lot of problems with adoption. All these sort of things are well documented. And when I look at the CCR, I'm wondering what, what level are the standards at with that? Like uh, what are your hopes? Do you really think this can be a viable thing? It, it seems better on the surface to me than just the simple electric health record. But I'm curious. It's central to everything you do with your portals. I'm wondering where it is. Okay. So the first question I would, would ask is, why does it need to be standardized? Uh, because the concept of electronic health records has, uh, I would suggest to you, probably 10 to 20 different definitions. If, it's, if you're a primary care doctor, they refer to it, if they indeed have one, to the electronic medical record. If you're in a hospital, you call it the electronic patient record. If you're at Smart Systems for Health, you call it the electronic health record. And if you're at Canada Health InfoWay, you call it the Pan-Canadian EHR with the minimum data set. So we need to use standards where they're appropriate. So I very much support standards because they're crucial. But when we translate standards into their application, then we need to deal with the expectation and the requirement uh, that is intended to be served. I'm one who personally believes that the concept of trying to develop the holy grail of a common EHR is flawed from its outset. Uh, we have an EPR at Sunnybrook of Women's. We started one in 1995. It is necessary and crucial to run our business. It's not necessary and crucial to provide good quality care. So, so to me, I'm not sure the concept of a standardized set of CCR records is something that we want to aspire to, as opposed to using excellent standards that allow us to build what it displays, what it represents, and to provide the uh, enablement to that relationship. Because it's a relationship builder. It's not to be used for anything other. So, so I'm not sure why standards would be an issue. Uh, one thing I was really interested in was your comment that uh, it's not moving as fast as you'd like and you're looking for uh, enablers and you pointed directly to the consumer yeah. in the slide. Uh, what do you see other than a SARS uh, outbreak again as a tipping point that's going to move it forward? What are those key things that you would like to see happen that would build that uh, um, uh, motion forward? Excellent question. Um, so, and we've addressed this. We've tried to address this at the OHA because we're very, very concerned about the, the entire opportunity of eHealth being an enabler. Uh, so number one, the first thing we would like to see, and, and, and all of us, I think, in the health system would like to see, is a very obvious and clear and declared priority at the government level. We want the premier, for example, to say what has been said by Tony Blair and George Bush in each of those countries, that the concept of sharing electronic information for patient safety, for the consumer. Both of them you know, have clear statements of values related to consumer involvement in their national initiatives. We need that government priority declaration. It doesn't exist at the moment. 
Secondly, we need to move, and this is probably not an easy thing to do, we need to make clinicians, quite frankly, comfortable with the concept uh, that patients do not pose a threat to them if, in fact, they are empowered with information that are provided to them verbally otherwise. So part number two is, quite frankly, work on the ground that needs to happen with leadership represented through my role in an organization like mine to, quite frankly, get the provider uh, model on site to engaging and empowering the consumer. And thirdly, and, and I referenced it, and I do a lot of this, I really think we need to create a media awareness campaign. And I've had deal, uh, discussions with Rogers, for example, where the discussion has to become much more mainstream. If e-health is continued to be associated with nothing more than technology, new tools and gadgets, then quite frankly, we are not, whether it's an EHR or whether it's a CCR, we're just not going to see any progress. Uh, and, and finally, we have to move away from the mega projects. Uh, to think that we're going to have longitudinal electronic health records for 7 million citizens in Ontario is quite frankly foolish. So we have to go niche and we have to build it iteratively. There's no silver bullet here. And those four things to me are quite frankly crucial. The first one probably being the most important thing. As soon as it becomes a government priority, it becomes an opportunity for stakeholders, both patient and organizational, to discuss how that priority relates to them as either a citizen, a participant, or a stakeholder in the system. I think that you <clears throat> partially answered my question uh, right now, but uh, I want to ask, uh, uh, last time when I attended Smart Systems for Health Ontario presentation, they were talking about electronic uh, records. And it seems to me that uh, this uh, CCR is uh, somewhat conflicting with that uh, record. Because if, if they want to have those data somewhere lo localized, somewhere, if, what are you going to provide them if they already have that, those data? Uh, let me start by saying that when we went public with our desire to uh, develop a CCR, the first phone call I got was from Smart Systems for Health. <laughs> uh, and a week later, I got a visit from them. Uh, and I know them very well because we, we work collaboratively. So uh, what turned out to be potential suspicion on the part of a conflicting and non-convergent strategy ended up to be a discussion where they were very much interested in working with us and fostering research. And remember, we're an academic health science center. So part of what we do, and I, I, if I didn't say this clearly before, is in fact to go through a process of discovery and hopefully end with a process of knowledge translation. Uh, and like any academic enterprise, the concept of research, uh, and, and trial is fundamental to everything we do and not only in the purview of the clinician domain. Uh, so in our domain, we have that responsibility as well. So our job is to push the envelope, to look at innovation in that context. But Smart Systems has, in fact, uh, met with us and will like to be involved, would like to become involved in the further evolution of this project because they believe it should be convergent and we believe it should be as well. While you've asked me that question, I'll tell you the second call I got was from, and that's from the Privacy Commissioner from Ontario, uh, for Ontario. And why? Because we, when we did the press release on this, believe it or not, there were immediate complaints, at least two, that went to them, that believed that all of a sudden, Sunnybrook and Women's would be sharing information with parties unknown, and who knows where that information might end up. So we met with the privacy commissioner as well and explained once again the concept of evolution here and research and development that we were intending and, and satisfied them that, quite frankly, this has to succeed and will only succeed by virtue of the consumer and patient being involved in this evolution. And therefore, the privacy issue has to be built with 
the Bill 31 requirements, which are, is the privacy legislation, clearly vesting the ownership of all health record information, as the legislation says, belonging to the patient anyways in the first place. So we saw that, that natural alignment on the regulatory side. But those were the very first two calls I got. <laughs> One more. Mm -hmm. Unrelated to technology, although I'm coming from technology, but uh, you mentioned that uh, treatment as it goes now is pretty much black box. Yeah. And uh, since you want to uh, encourage uh, customers to take part, I'm wondering how you are going to encourage uh, providers to, to share some uh, knowledge and information with us, you know. Mm -hmm. Because it seems that uh, they, very hard, uh, they don't yeah. like to part with their knowledge so easily. Well, um, I have the good fortune in my organization uh, to, and it's not pervasive, so it goes back to some of the key uh, milestones. But in my organization, I have the good fortune uh, of, of seeing a, a lot of different parts of the island represented that I showed in the picture but also a lot of the integration uh, through good leadership and champions. One of the slides showed the fact that we have to nurture, develop champions. I should have mentioned that as well. Uh, it, it, we want to see some real clinical champions emerge here, uh, and the clinical champions being able to say that this is good for the public and good for the consumer. Uh, so that uh, back to the previous question. So family health teams, primary care and family health teams. My family doctor is at Women's College. My family's family doctor, my two kids and my wife, are all cared for by the family health teams at Women's College. Family health teams uh, at Women's College will ha would not have it any other way other than having the patients involved in the exchange of information, the provision of information, so, and that's the way we want it. So this is also about, uh, going back to the issue of standards, consumer choice. Uh, your question uh, about well, some patients may not be comfortable with this. That's fine. So there are areas of opportunity, but it is going to be one of the significant issues. But I believe the family health teams that are being set up in the province and their intention will become, uh, quite frankly, the change agent for this paradigm to occur. The osteoporosis portal is a good example. The first, before we could make the announcement, we needed to be satisfied that we had clinicians that were prepared to do this. Dr. Jillian Hawker and the interdisciplinary team that run these, this program in Women's College are totally signed on for this. They are the ones who are going to be promoting it to their patients, recruiting the patients that are comfortable with this, and then more importantly, uh, because it's a chronic disease, becoming the advocate as necessary for other parts of the healthcare system to participate in well. So you have to find your sweet spots, you have to find your opportunities. There is no silver bullet, so it's going to take a long time as well, and it's going to happen overnight. But we believe, quite frankly, this is a, has got a much better chance of making progress in the way we'd like to see it than the monolithic, mega-project approach of the current e-health view and architectures that we see. We've had sweet spots and silver bullets and low-hanging fruit. Yeah. The only thing I didn't hear is the whole nine yards so far. <laughs> is anybody completing their, that to you. <laughs> anybody completing their administrative bingo cards has gotten bingo yet? <laughs> I, I'd like to, you'll either love me or hate me for this. I'd like to open up without, I was trying to think of a very directed question. Yeah. You mentioned the mega projects. You mentioned the EHR. Could you talk a bit about, from your own vantage point, e, the whole health e-health strategy within Ontario? Take that anywhere you want. Mm -hmm. um, well, right now, I'm, and I'll, I'll answer very directly because I, you know, I have no, no problem doing it. Um, at the moment, the health strategy that does exist in the province uh, has good and bad, like anything else. Uh, um, the bad is, at the moment, too many command, what I call command and control projects that are top-down uh, architectures that suggest that uh, a data repository collecting all of the information of a longitudinal record, whatever that is defined to be, will be managed, collected, and maintained on a real-time 24-7 basis and accessible to all healthcare providers in this province through a secure network. Admirable and lofty goals. It's just not going to happen. Um, you need certain provincial 
architected initiatives like a common registry of identification so that information can be tagged and shared with proper ID tagging. Uh, the good part is that at least this e-health strategy through that representation has gotten on the agenda and you know, has gotten in the early investments and has, most importantly, provided an opportunity for all the stakeholders to collaborate. Our definition talked about collaboration. So we do see the Ontario eHealth Council as being an excellent vehicle for that dialogue continuing because the primary care doctors are there through the Ontario Medical Association. The community care centers are there through their representation and the cont continuity of that. The hospitals are there and the labs are there and pharmacy will soon be there. So we see the good about that being that the eHealth strategy can continue to involve with stakeholder collaboration. And thirdly, uh, that eHealth strategy at some point, at some point, and this is probably the most significant concern we have and I continue to have, must see its way and find its way into the local communities and the investments need to follow. And if and when the local health integration networks, which there are going to be 14 in this province, which will be responsible to provide, to plan, provide, and then manage the health care of defined populations within geographies. So I'm not sure which, what the boundaries are for the Waterloo area, but in Toronto, we belong to the Toronto Central Lynn. There are 14 of them in the province. They've been named. Uh, that the e-health strategy will have to be managed and provided locally through those lens. So at some point, that has to be addressed. So the provincial strategy has some good points in terms of, of identifying investments, creating the collaborative framework, providing early opportunity for participating priority identification. I am concerned, however, of the command control big project mentality that suggests single information systems are the solution across the entire province because they automatically give you common standards and common, it's just not going to happen. So, that's very well said. Yeah. Very, 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 very My good. Feedback. Any other questions from anyone else? Um, if not, I'll end with one further question. Uh, one of the things that seems to be a big issue in this province is the human resources capacity to carry out any e health strategy. Uh, you know, what are your views on that? Do you think we, uh, where do you think we need to go with regard to that? And how can we, uh, as, a, as a university, respond appropriately to that? Major concern. First of all, the news in healthcare that the students and potential bright minds that will really solve this issue is all negative. So if you were a student and, and, or a high school student at that and read healthcare news and saw nothing but negatives, it is not exactly the most attack, attractive industry that, that uh, is, becomes a magnet or an employer of choice, an industry of choice. So we have to deal with that issue because we are not seeing the replacements to the cliche that we use, that it's always the same people on the bus who talk about e-health, that demonstrate some passion for it, that might get it right or wrong, but at least are trying to move the yardsticks. And we're not seeing, and I'm seeing it whether it's on the ground in my organization, and I'm, I'm sure I talk to my colleagues, we're not seeing the kind of regeneration that we need and the bright minds, quite frankly, uh, that are necessary to really move in the directions that the technology no limits will apply. And I don't know how to turn that paradigm around because it is really um, symptomatic of our industry as a whole. And we'll have to deal with, with the issue because this is where I go back to a comment I made. It's going to come a point in time where we have the money, but we don't have the people. Uh, and we'll be in a situation where money cannot solve the problems that we're facing. And I'm not sure what the solution is as yet, but certainly uh, developing much more skilled base of workers. And I like what I heard from your computer sciences uh, direction here, that you want to take the programming bar down from what it is to a much more simple uh, set of tools that are available. So you have a broad, uh, you know, much uh, broader set of skills and more general nature that could take advantage of technologies. 
So we need to do a combination of those things, but I'm not sure I have a, an answer to your question in terms of solution other than to acknowledging it's a real, real problem. Part of the solution, uh, we believe, is to first see the problem, and I think we're all beginning to see it. Uh, last, we pointed out that in uh, Counter Health InfoWay and also Smart System for Health, they pointed out a need for 2,000 people, and we've uh, noticed uh, that the programs across the country, all the educational programs, do not, uh, do not produce in excess of, I believe, 70 people a year into this field. It's a huge gap. And luckily, things are opening up. The colleges are getting involved. The universities are creating programs. But it will be five years before they produce those. So we face a significant problem. And as you know, one of the problems with the mega projects is the enormous use of consultants, often extramural consultants. And uh, we're sort of like a developing country in that way, where a lot of the people that are doing the work are, are going to leave at the end and uh, uh, when the money runs out. And that's going to leave us in a capacity, a significant capacity problem. Well, Sam, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank Sam as well. And, and in closing, I just want to say that it's been um, my pleasure to be a part of this seminar series uh, from September to June of this year. It's been a, a very interesting path that we've gone down, and, and you've given a very fine closing, something that we can now aspire to in terms of uh, direct steps to the future, so thank you again very much. Just two small notes. Uh, uh, please come back and see us again in September. <laughs> We'd like to see all your faces again and bring your colleagues. We need this room full. And uh, second, uh, we are taking a small step in trying to provide uh, a few more people enabled in this area with our Health Informatics Boot Camp. That will be held in July of this year, July 17th to the uh, uh, 22nd at the University of Waterloo. One week intensive course in applied health informatics. Uh, we are taking, we are still taking registrations, although registration is getting a little tight. Uh, but we want to offer this again. So please, if you're interested at all, uh, either for this session or one in the future, please register if you're thinking of, of coming. So with that, I bid you all adieu, and we'll see you again in September. Thanks a lot. <laughs>